So tonight's agenda, uh, we're going to cover what the heck is an AWS account baseline, uh, talk about the root user for AWS accounts, some basic IAM stuff, so identity and access management, uh, talk about, about billing, auditing, uh, EBS, encryption and backup, so elastic black block storage, a uh, bit of networking stuff, uh, some more IAM, a bit of organizations. Uh, so yeah, uh, there are a few caveats. Uh, this talk is going to cover the what, not the how. Uh, there are excellent documentation and tutorials online for how to do the things. Um, and this is not an, a definitive guide. Um, this is like my my approach to doing stuff after a few years of having to do the same stuff over and over again and learning the hard way about certain things. Um, and we're going broad, not deep. So we are going to talk like there's quite a lot of AWS services mentioned, but each one of them, i.e. each one of those things on the side could be an entire talk just by itself. So we're going to go over stuff. Um, some things do cost money. Some things are more expensive than others. Um, so if you are doing this on like your hobby account, um, actually look at the pricing, which you should absolutely do for all AWS stuff anyway. Um, and also, this is version one of the talk. So um, it's going to be a bit rough around the edges. And there's a feedback thing at the link at the end. Um, so any feedback would be really appreciated. So where are we? A recap before we crack on with the AWS shared responsibility uh, shared responsibility model. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, uh, the AWS uh, shared responsibility looks like that. Um, Essentially, you can just look at the first two blocks, the customer and AWS. Unless you work for AWS, you're the top one. Um, so you are responsible for security in the cloud. AWS are responsible for security of the cloud. So AWS handle all of like the physical security for their infrastructure, the data centers, uh, networking, encryption at the disk level, all of that kind of good stuff, the software that runs on all of the actual servers. And then basically, you as the customer are responsible for the security of everything you deploy into the cloud. So basically, we're going to cover a lot of stuff that goes through security aspects. If you configure it wrongly, like you just leave all of your uh, address networks open to the public, or you give everything a public IP address, like your database, for example, uh, and don't secure it, then uh, it's your fault and you can't go complaining to AWS that they did something wrong. So yeah, if you're not aware of it, have a quick look. So uh, if you're working with AWS, it's good to know what you should and should not be responsible for. So baselines. Uh, so baselines, uh, basically, they contain resources which aren't directly related to the workload uh, or your workloads that you're running, but help with risk reduction, security, compliance, and bootstrapping. So it's kind of like the basic first layer that you add to a newly created account um, that helps with all of those things. It's not, you know, you don't have an account just to run a baseline. It's not a piece of, it's not a workload that you run. It's not a server that you deploy. It's not your web service that you're running. Um, it's all to do with risk reduction, security, and compliance. Uh, generally, if you're running an AWS organization, which we'll cover a little bit at the end, um, this baseline will deploy, be deployed across all accounts in the organization. Um, so you generally don't have, you might have a little bit of variation uh, depending on the purpose of what the account is for in comparison to everything else. But generally speaking, the baseline will apply to all of the accounts in the organization. Uh, and they're often managed by the infra platform team if you have one um, or if you've got like random DevOps person in the corner, um, it'll probably be their job to set this up. If you don't have that, it'll be whichever developer you decide to, you're the person creating an AWS account, good luck. Um, if that's you, you should definitely pay attention. Um, so the root user. So the root user in an AWS account is the email address with which you sign up and create the account. There are two rules. There are exactly two rules for managing the root user. Number one, do not use the root user. Number two, do not use the root user. Uh, so one of the things that you should not be doing in AWS is using your root user credentials. Um, you basically create the account, immediately create another user, and then lock the original details away in a vault, really secure, far away from anything and anyone. Um, and that should apply even if you're just using it for like your hobby account. Um, so for my own AWS account, um, I have my own user, not the root user that I use for actually doing stuff. Um, so the first thing that you should do is, oh, sorry, here we go. Uh, it's a dedicated email address. So if you're a business, um, or even if it's just your own account, it's always good to use not your actual email address, like you know your address 
plus AWS or something, or if you've got your own domain, AWS at, AWS, AWS at. Uh, but yeah, make it kind of distinct because it just helps with A, scheduling emails, because if they email, email you to say you owe the money and you miss it, um, that's probably not great. So you can actually do routing properly. Um, but yeah, your root user should have multi-factor authentication enabled. Please, please enable multi-factor authentication um, and also then lock the details securely away, as I've said. Uh, you will enable IAM access to billing and cost management. You can Google how to do that, but it basically means rather than the root user being the only user that can do billing and cost management, you can delegate it to people uh, or the users that you create. Uh, at which point you should then create an IAM group for administrators, you can call it super users, super administrators, Jedi, whatever you want. Uh, but create a group, uh, assign it the administrator access policy so that they basically get all the access to the account with the exception to the things that only the root user can do. Uh, so the, the root user, the main thing that they can do is delete the account. Um, and that's the thing that you're the, one of the main things that you're guarding against. It's like someone just coming in and just being able to delete your account. Hobby accounts, probably not so much of a problem if you're a company and someone deletes your organization account, that's not gonna be going well for you. Um, and then you're gonna create a, an IAM user for yourself um, and assign it to that group so that your user, which will just be a username, uh, will then have administrator access to your account. Job done. And then you log out, log back in as that user, and then carry on doing all the other things. Basic IAM. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, IAM is Identity and Access Management. Um, it basically covers exactly that, identity, so the users, and access management, the things that they can and cannot do. Um, so what should you be setting up first? A password policy for all users in your account, including you. Um, hopefully, when you created your user, you, both the root user and your IAM user, you used a really good, nice, secure password. And now you should set a password policy that reflects that. Um, anyone want to have a stab at minimum password length? 16. Yeah, I'd go, I'd go 16. Four words. Four words, as long as it's more than 16 yeah. characters. 16, 16 words. 16 words. <laughs> <laughs> just a sentence. Uh, yeah, so whatever it is, um, you know, just set an appropriate password policy. Um, there are multiple um, resources online, uh, NIST, and uh, what's the UK one? Um, Hmm? NCSC. Yeah, that one, uh, NCSC, uh, and probably some others floating around that give you good, good advice. Uh, you should enforce multi-factor authentication, but allow user self-management. Uh, there is a policy that you can look up on the AWS website, which will give you the details for that. But essentially, it means that users must have multi-factor multi authentication enabled, but they can also manage their own account. So they can reset their own password. They can change their multi-factor device if they lose it um, and other stuff. So basically, especially if you're in a company, you don't have to have everyone coming to you every five minutes saying, oh, I forgot my password or um, I've lost my phone or the little token or whatever else. Uh, you're going to, uh, yeah, so you basically create an IAM policy and attach it to the groups that you want to have that policy. So any human user should have that policy attached to them, which basically then says any action that they take on within AWS must have been authenticated via multi-factor authentication. Um, and if they haven't, then it won't let you do anything. Uh, you probably want to create some groups as well. So we've already created an administrator group. Uh, and you know, if it's just you and it's your account, you can probably just get away with just doing that. Um, if you're a company, you probably don't want to give everyone administrator access to your AWS account. Um, regardless of who they are, almost certainly you don't know what to give, you don't want to give the CEO uh, administrator access to your uh, AWS account, unless they're, unless they're tech-minded. Um, but usually the, you know, you're going to create a bunch of groups uh, based on functions within the business um, that people will need. So like you can have a viewer group. So everyone can have like kind of view access, read-only access to the account um, and resources within it. Um, you probably you might want to be a little bit more specific with that. Uh, developer uh, group for obviously the developers. Um, you might want to give the finance people access to the billing cost management and the ability to change the payment methods and stuff like that. Uh, you might have a power users group. Whatever the groups are, they're going to be based on you know what your business needs. But there's just some ideas to give you some uh, more ideas. 
Uh, you're going to attach uh, relevant policies. So uh, AWS provide a whole bunch of pre-managed, also uh, AWS managed IAM policy. So you can give access to people to different things. So they've got uh, full access to certain services. They've got read-only access to certain services. They've got power users. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, so obviously you're going to uh, use those as much as possible because don't write your own IAM if you can avoid it. If someone has done it for you, just use that uh, and just attach it to the relevant groups. Uh, you want to be aware of granting too wide permissions. Um, so particular things to bear in mind. So CloudWatch logs, S3 buckets, secrets manager, parameter store, encryption keys. Uh, those are the kind of things that contain more sensitive stuff rather than just a list of EC2 instances or uh, Lambda functions that you're running that you might want to actually not give people access to. So either you uh, put in an explicit deny in with policies that you're creating or you don't list it in the allow list that you're creating for the policy. Um, so yeah, just be aware of permissions. Billing. Um, question. There's lots. Uh, so, what, so the question is like, what? Well, generally, what's better, allow or deny? Um, I would say there's use cases for both. Um, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, obviously, yes, deny trumps everything. So you can have all the allows that you like, but a single deny anywhere in the chain of whatever policies will block access to to that thing. Um, so you can get into scenarios, for instance, if you've got a deny policy on a group. Um, but then like uh, an allow policy on another group that you lock yourself out of stuff. So if you're in the uh, administrators group and you've got the administrator access policy, but then you attach another policy that denies things, then even though you've got admin access, the deny policy will take precedence and you will be denied access to those things. So you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot a little bit. Um, so I would just say be careful with denies because they're so explicit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so billing, uh, this is useful even if it's just your own account. Um, AWS don't have the ability to specify a limit that you cannot exceed. Um, and you can quite easily, if you're not sure what you're doing, spend a lot of money very quickly in AWS. Um, if you're a business, that's probably not too bad or the end of the world. If it's just you um, and you've suddenly got a bill for a couple of thousand dollars, you might be like, uh, so um, yeah, pay attention to billing. Uh, there's a billing console. Um, the menu there is on, on, from it on the on the right hand side. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is enable Cost Explorer. Cost Explorer is an amazing tool, and it will show you exactly where you're spending your money in AWS. Um, you can do all kinds of like filtering um, and grouping and colorful graphs and everything. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and if you are the person in your company that's responsible for the cost of your AWS accounts you will use this a lot. I have in the past. Um, people come and go, oh, how much is this application costing us? Uh, let me go and find out for you. Um, you are going to want to set up a budget and spending alert. So as I said, you can't have an explicit list, uh, uh, set amount. Um, but what you can do is set up a budget and spending alerts and have it email you uh, when you reach those alerts, which is great even if you're a business because you can say, right, I'm regularly expecting to spend $1,000 a month. $10,000 a month, whatever it is. Um, but you can do stuff like uh, get an email based on percentages. So if you go, this is my budget, this is what roughly we spend, and you set up an email, I want to get this email when we spend 50% of this amount, you should get that email roughly halfway through the month. If you get it on day three, that's something to investigate. And the idea is that you get as early warning as possible about spending that you haven't anticipated. Um, might be a, a rogue developer, uh, it might even be a rogue platform engineer, um, or it might just be accident. Um, you might have been hacked because obviously you weren't paying attention to security. Um, so it's always good to get uh, an early uh, indicator of what your costs are going to be. Uh, yeah, budget amounts. Uh, consolidated billing basically means if you set up an organization, you'll just build through one account. Um, rather, so rather than getting 60 invoices, if you've got 60 accounts, you get one invoice. Uh, there we go. Uh, tax settings again. If you're a business, less important. If you're, you know, not VAT registered, uh, but you can set up uh, your tax settings. So enter your VAT, the details, etc. And uh, you can also then enable inheritance so that it will go through the organisation, and you only have to enter it once rather than having to do it for every single account. Well, 
Oh, yeah, we've got two of these because I complained. <laughs> it's worth mentioning that billing is eventually consistent. So you won't get an alert the instant you hit 50%. It will probably be the day after. Yeah. Which can suck. But. Yeah. And again, so, you, you know, you, you can set it up to 50%. And as John said, you know, you might get an email the next day that says you've suddenly spent $5,000. Um, but at least, you know, then rather than at the end of the month where it might be $50,000. So, yeah, um, bear that in mind. Uh, so auditing, um, for that, you're going to be using CloudTrail, which is basically one of those things that you turn on. Um, it basically logs uh, all the activity on an account to an S3 bucket. Uh, there's management accounts and, uh, sorry, management events and I want to say data events, something, something like that. Um, but basically any uh, activity, any API call, anything user clicks on on the console, all of that kind of stuff basically gets logged to an S3 bucket. Um, this is handy even if it's just your own account because you can remember what you did. Uh, and also if your details do get compromised, you can at least find out what someone's been doing. Um, you're going to want to create a dedicated uh, encryption key for CloudTrail. So don't use the built-in service one. I would say create an explicit key just for that. Um, you're going to create an organization trail um, if you're using organizations. Uh, and you're going to lock down uh, access to that encryption key and that S3 bucket. So that's one of the things I was talking about earlier in terms of uh, wider permissions, you want to lock those things down because those are the things that audit the activity on your account. What you don't want is someone compromising your account and then just changing all of the audit logs to make it look like they were never there. You might as well not have audit logs. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can set up uh, Athena to query the CloudTrail logs, which basically just means that you can go into the AWS console, write an SQL query, um, and get loads of insights into what people have been doing. Um, so you can just buy on what everyone's been clicking on and stuff like that and find out who has been spending all the money um, or leaking credentials or anything other stuff that you would want to audit. Uh, there is a thing called uh, CloudTrail Lake, which can manage event storage and querying for you. So rather than having to kind of do manual setup with things, you can just go, I want to use CloudTrail Lake um, and it will just create a data store and let you query it and stuff. Uh, it trades ease of use for flexibility or flexibility for ease of use, i.e. it's easier to use, but it's less flexible um, just in terms of what you can do with it. Generally speaking, John, not specific, don't, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and you can set up uh, alerts for high-risk events, so such as the root account login, which obviously no one should ever do because we've already said don't do that. So you can have a, an alert set up that says anytime that happens, you get an email about it, um, or it, go, it basically goes to a notifications topic. Um, so you could put it to Slack, you could send it to Pager Duty, whatever. Um, so whatever you want, but you can set up alerts for those kind of things. Like you can set it up for watching pretty much anything. So if someone spins up a, an, an EC2 instance in a region that you don't want, um, you can get an alert for that as well. Uh, also on auditing, uh, there's a service called AWS Guard Duty. Uh, which is a threat detection service that continuously monitors your AWS accounts and workloads uh, using CloudTrail, VPC logs, so net network logs, and network traffic logs, and, and DNS logs. Um, it's basically, again, one of those things that you kind of just turn on. It does stuff in the background, and it will give you insights into as and when certain those things events, such as uh, Bitcoin mining on EC2 instances, um, or anom anomalous usage from an IAM identity. So if a user has logged in and they're doing something they don't normally do, um, so they're trying to get a list of something that they wouldn't normally try and get a list of, um, or things that could be used to like either discover or attack resources within your account, uh, GuardGT can flag those up as, hmm, maybe you want to look into this. Um, obviously, if you are mining Bitcoin on EC2, um, A, you're doing it wrong, um, <laughs> and B, obviously, you probably want to uh, like um, suppress those alerts. Uh, you've got to enable it for every region explicitly. Um, so if you are using loads of regions, you've got to go into every one and enable it explicitly. If you're only using a couple, you could probably just enable just the couple that you're using. Uh, you can also do it programmatically so that you only just run a script and it does it all for you. Uh, and also, you can automate response workflows. So you can basically, uh, when an event happens, you can trigger a Lambda function that can remediate that thing. Um, obviously, that's a little bit more involved, a little bit more work, uh, but it is kind of possible. So you could say, for example, oh, if there is an EC2 instance mining Bitcoin, terminate it with extreme prejudice, um, for example. 
AWS Config. Uh, so Guard Duty and Config, um, they're kind of, I'd say, I'd say they're optional definitely for like personal accounts. You probably don't need to them. Guard Duty, you could probably get away with because it's fairly cheap. Um, Config is still quite cheap, but it's also a bit more involved in its setup, um, and you probably don't really need it. Um, even if you're if you're a small business, you might not even need it then. Um, cool, no extremely negative reactions in the room, so that's good. Um, it's kind of down to you know your your risk appetite, etc. Uh, so basically, uh, AWS Config evaluates resource configuration against predetermined rules. So when you create resources in AWS, uh, Config will evaluate it against its rules. Um, I think I've got some examples in there. Uh, but essentially, uh, have I enabled encryption on all of my buckets or the bucket that has just been created or um, are all the EC2 instances below a certain size or wh whatever the rules might be. Uh, again, you've got to turn it on for every region. Uh, there's a large number of managed rules. This is where the examples are. There we go. Uh, so it comes with a whole bunch of managed rules. Um, obviously, you can also create your own examples in there, include auto scaling um, across multiple uh, availability zones. So if you're setting up an auto, auto scale group, does it actually span multiple AZs? Obviously, if you've got auto scaling, but it's all in one AZ and that AZ disappears, you don't really have auto scaling. It makes no point, no difference. Or you do, but it's not very resilient. Uh, and also, do all the IAM users have MFA enabled? So that will have a catch. You know, is there a group that didn't have that policy attached or a user that managed to slip through the net? That will catch them as well. Uh, and obviously, you can have custom rules. Uh, and it also provide automatic remediation for certain things. Again, it's a bit more involved. Um, I'm not going through the hows. I'm not doing a tech demo that will fail. Um, excuse me. Uh, EBS encryption and easy backups. Uh, encryption is one of those things that you definitely want. AWS have recently changed S3 to enable encryption by default, so you can't, I think you can turn it off now, can you? It's just there. Are there exceptions? Yeah, there's like some, if you create an account after the date, it's just encrypted, tough. Um, you can't yet do that with EBS, um, but there is an option buried deep within the AWS console where you can turn on EBS encryption by default. So you don't even have to then go and tick the box when you create the instance, or remember to specify it if you're writing Terraform or CloudFormation. Um, yeah, so we're gonna enable it by default. Um, again, you've got to do that explicitly for every region. <laughs> encryption. Uh, so yeah, EBS encryption, you can set it on by default. You've got to do it for every region. I'll show you how to do that in a second. The other thing that I really like doing because I, I'm, well, I'm an engineer, I'm lazy, um, is uh, easy backups. Um, and obviously with uh, EBS, you can do snapshots and you can go into the console and set snapshots and you can use AWS backup, et cetera. But there is a thing called data lifecycle manager and you can create policies for it, which basically means that you can tell it to automatically take snapshots of EBS volumes that match your policy. So you can set up some tag value combinations and set it up on a schedule to say every, whenever the schedule triggers, uh, find all the volumes with this tag and take a snapshot. Backup's done, tick. Uh, so you can do a schedule. So I set up uh, a policy for daily, twice daily, weekly, and then for any EBS volume that I've got, I can just go uh, set a, snap, uh, a tag called snapshot and give it a value, one of those values, um, and it will automatically uh, go and take snapshots. And the policy has a retention time on it, so it will say it will keep either X amount of snapshot snapshots um, or keep them for a certain period of time. Um, but it's just a really easy way of not having to worry about it. Obviously, there are more. Uh, elaborate backup mechanisms um, that you can use. So you can use AWS backup. Um, but this for me is because we're talking about account, ba account baselines, right? So you can just throw this in an account um, and then people could just use it um, or you can use it, um, which I find really helpful because um, I haven't got to think about it. So basically, what is EBS? So EBS is basically the, the the disks that you connect to EC2 instances, um, yeah, um, or the disks that you connect to. I mean, they're virtual disks, obviously, uh, but it's the storage for the EC2 instances. It's the storage for your RDS instances, so your databases, um, that kind of stuff, basically. But not your buckets or your... No, so S3's, F3's and different. S3's are different. S3 is just object storage. This is block storage. Uh, so disks, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, and because everyone loves Bash, and I'm a platform engineer, so I love Bash. Uh, there is the Bash script for enabling uh, encryption by default in three regions, because they're the three regions that I care about most of the time. Uh, EU US, uh, US East 1, uh, EU US and EU US 2. So Virginia, uh, Ireland, and London. But basically, you just run a command uh, on the CLI for each region, and job done. Um, for some reason, you can't do that in the console. Please, AWS, fix the console so that I can do that for everywhere. <laughs> it is, yeah. It, it, like if you, yeah, it's not even easy to find. I even had to look for it when I was trying to remember where it was. Um, so networking. I know there's a few network people in the room. Uh, networking is fun. It's also quite hard. Uh, and when I say networking is fun, of course, I mean cloud networking. Physical networking with like, you know, cables and stuff and patch, cab patch cables in a cupboard, hard pass. Um, clicking buttons around and automating some scripts and stuff, networking, lovely, love that. Uh, so the one thing to bear in mind with networks is that you can't peer networks, so link them together, if the IP ranges overlap, side of blocks, without NAT or network address translation. Um, and no one likes NAT. It's a real pain in the neck. You say you like NAT. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a pain. So um, basically, um, we'll come on to IP blocks in a, in a second. Um, but every region in an AWS account will have a default a default BPC, virtual private. Cloud, yep, there we go. <laughs> Virtual private cloud, so it's a private network. Uh, they all have the same CIDR range. So 172.31.0.0 slash 16. Uh, that's the same in every region. So obviously the second point, you can't peer or connect networks with overlapping ranges, means that by default, you can't peer two VPC or two default VPCs across um, AWS regions. Um, I don't know why they all have the same IP, I mean, consistency, maybe. Um, maybe do your own networking, which we're going to come on to. Uh, so yeah, so bear that in mind. Uh, and they also only have public subnets. So by default, uh, anything you put in them will get a public IP address, which is probably not where you want to put databases and other things that, well, pretty much anything other than a load balancer, generally speaking. Uh, sorry? Yeah, so th that's where you get NAT. All right, smiles. <laughs> uh, yes, that is a private network, uh, but it will get the things will also get private, uh, sorry, public IP addresses if they're in a public subnet. I'm not going into the hows and details of networking. Um, yeah, not doing that. But point bear to bear in mind is having a network plan, however simple, doesn't have to be super amazing. Um, will save you a lot of stress later on. Um, I was chatting to Jack earlier, and he's like, what do you do when you run out of IP space for like the entire private range? I'm like, I don't know. I can't help you. Um, but uh, yeah, have, have some kind of vague plan. Um, and I'm just going to go through kind of what I put in my baseline um, because it's flexible, and it kind of gets you out of problems later on. Um, obviously, if you're working for an organization that actually has its own networking plan set up, um, then you can pretty much disregard this. Um, or you, you know, feel free to disregard it anyway. Uh, but this is kind of just what I do and what I recommend to people because it's worked for me in the past. So uh, quick recap on private network ranges. Uh, there are three. Um, you can look at this up on Wikipedia. It's a really interesting read. Um, there is the 192.168 address space, which people probably recognize. There are 65,000 addresses in it. And most home office and networks use that space. Um, I don't know what we use here, actually. Um, but yeah, almost certainly everyone's home network, unless you're doing something fancy, um, we'll just have that because it's what most home routers come with set up. 172.31, blah, 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 blah. There's a million addresses in that. That's quite a lot for any company to be able to use. A um, couple of things to bear in mind with this, though. Docker uses 172.17 uh, by default. So obviously, if you've got an IP range that uses that, and you're using Docker, it may or may not get a little bit confused. And you definitely just don't want to be debugging network problems because it's such a pain. Uh, and obviously, we've covered the default BPCs use 172.1. Uh, there is an entire 10 dot block, so a slash eight, with 16 million addresses in it. Now we're talking. Uh, just use that. 
Yeah, because most of the time you won't conflict unless, you know, yeah, you're Joel over there who runs his own. <laughs> you, I'm not talking uh, IPv6 either. Uh, obviously, you could use IPv6, but I mean, yeah, I don't want to. No one wants to. Yeah. Uh, so um, I just say use uh, the 10 block. Um, oh, sorry. Question. Go on in, Joel. Sorry. Not, I'm not trying to be difficult. This is actually a fourth one. Uh, no, uh, there's another four, uh, fourth range is under 100 dot. It's used for CGNet. Oh, yeah. Car yeah. Yeah. Carrier grade NAT. Yeah. We're, yeah. I'm not talking that. I mean, you, you are technically correct. The best sort of correct. Uh, I would, I would deem, I would deem, I would deem carrier grade NAT as out of scope for for this. This is an account baseline. If you need carrier grade NAT for your AWS network, um, like what Jack was talking about earlier, um, or even though they were in Azure, but you know, um, then yeah, don't be listening to me talk about networking. <laughs> this is like this is like simple stuff. If you're not sure, and this is a bit of an intro. Um, anyway, uh, so take the 10 block. I divide it up into slash 16. So for each network, uh, that gives you 65K addresses in each network, and you can have 256 networks. So if you're running, say, a network per environment or a network per account, you can have 255 of those. Um, for any business, it would probably take you a reasonable amount of time to use up 255 networks. Um, and again, if you get to the point where you get anywhere near that number, don't be listening to me. Um, you, at some point, you would have hired a network professional who would have come up with a strategy for how you actually want to set everything up and migrate you. Um, I can recommend someone if you need. Um, so uh, I generally set them up in the following format. So I have 10.0 uh, for shared services. So uh, in that, you might want to put your VPN uh, instance if you're not using a cloud-provided one, uh, or your Bastion instances, or anything that's kind of shared across accounts. Um, where you only want one of the things. Um, then we've got obviously production, uh, which I put on 10.1, staging that I put on 10.2, and dev on 10.3. Um, so one of the benefits of doing that is that if you look at the IP address for any of your services or your instances or your databases, uh, and you see an IP address, you can rationalize what account slash environment it belongs to or what network it belongs to, um, which I always find really handy um, when you're dealing with stuff. Uh, that's the general structure. I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but basically you get three public subnets, three private subnets. Uh, because you're going to deploy most stuff in private subnets, um, you get 8,192 addresses in each of those subnets, a bunch of an unallocated space. So you could have uh, private subnets for your databases if you wanted more subnets. If you wanted more availability zones, then the space there for that. Uh, and then over in public, you only you only get 4,096 addresses in each subnet. Um, again, any company or even an individual, good luck as an individual, filling up like the address space for one of these networks, let alone all of them. Um, Yeah, so this is, bait where I'm not talking external to AWS, so what you see if you connect outside of AWS inwards, this is just within your own little private network boundary. Um, and you can obviously with the, because they're different networks, you can peer them together um, using various tools and techniques, which I'm not going to cover. Um, peering or transit gateway are the main ones, you know, private link, direct connect, blah, 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 blah. Um, but uh, because the your main thing you're bearing in mind is that the addresses or the IP ranges don't overlap, so that, that it gives you the ability to then connect them later on if you so wish. Obviously, production shouldn't be talking to staging generally, um, but if there is ever a condition where you want to do that, maybe you want to link something to copy some data somewhere or, or whatever it is, at least you've got that option. Whereas if everything's just using the same range or you've constrained yourself, then you, you don't even have that option. Um, so it gives you the ability to make conscious choices about what you do and don't want. I feel a question. So yeah, sorry. So good question. What's the difference between private and public here? So here we're talking uh, the subnets within AWS. So within AWS uh, network, you can have this, it's got the concept of private subnets and public subnets. So private subnets are only visible or routable within your own network. So nothing from outside can see into them ever. 
unless you actually explicitly route something via a public subnet uh, to it. So it's it's a little bit complicated and I don't want to dive too deep into networking. Um, we can chat afterwards and I'll kind of go through it. Um, but yeah, uh, the stuff that's in public subnets will generally get a public IP address. So if you were to create an EC2 instance in a public subnet, it would also get a publicly routable IP address that random people on the internet can then hit. Um, and that may or may not be something that you want. Obviously, if it's your bastion host or your vpn instance you probably want people to be able to connect to it from wherever if it's your database you probably don't want random person in random country trying to hit your database um i mean obviously you should be running databases in rds anyway but again you would still get a public address if you tick the box um whereas if it's in a private subnet you're reasonably certain that bear in mind as long as no one's done something really stupid <laughs> which is possible um that st the, the people on the random internet can't connect to your stuff so even if you have a security group or a firewall rule that says just allow anything from anywhere that anywhere isn't the public internet um so yeah does that help yes I'm just going to have to keep this, aren't I? <laughs> the point is, a public sub, every instance, resource, whatever in AWS, always gets a private IP address. That's what that range is. If it's in a public subnet, it also gets a public IP address. But you, see, you don't see it on your interface. You see it in the console. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, you basically, if it, an EC2 instance in a public uh, subnet would have two IP addresses. It would like two network interfaces, one with the private address, one with the public address. Um, and yes, you can do stuff like even in a public subnet, you could not give it a private IP address. Um, but then we're getting too far into the weeds. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, so this is how I basically set up networks when I have to spin up an AWS account uh, or an organization. Um, mainly is that I can have options later on in terms of how you can peer them and connect them. And also because it means things are identifiable. So again, because you've got consistency there with uh, the, uh, you know, the availability zone, so A, B, and C, and whether it's public or private. So if I get like a 10.1.1.1 .1 .1 address, I know that that's going to be in private A, for example. So I know which availability zone it's in and which network or account it's in. Uh, I am restrictions. So very quickly, because time's getting on. Uh, so there are things called service control policies and IAM policies. IAM policies we've kind of covered earlier. That's what you assign to groups. Uh, service control policies are at the organization level, which I'll come on to in a second, um, which basically override, uh, for want of a better word, uh, your IAM policies. So they determine like the maximum set of permissions that you are allowing in effectively an organization. So they're kind of organization wide. Um, so you can apply things uh, like, uh, well, I'm gonna cover in a second, actually. Uh, so you can restrict what regions you can use. So you can say, right, we only ever use uh, Ireland, for example, as a region. So why would anyone need to spin something up in like Africa or the US or whatever? Um, so you can set up a, a policy that if someone tries to create anything in a different region or a region that you're not allowing, you will just get a deny error, even if they've got administrator access in that account. Um, this is also really handy um, just for you know most companies. You're not going to be looking at multiple regions. Is the reason why I had the US East one, uh, EU West, and EU uh, one and two, uh, because the vast majority of uh, companies will just be operating out of one, like possibly all three of those regions, but you're unlikely to be unless you're properly global um other other regions and even then you're probably just using cloudfront um which is global anyway um so anyway uh yeah don't forget about uh eus one so e sorry eu us east one uh, because certain things that are global actually live in that region. So if you don't allow access to it or those services, uh, then things won't work. So for example, all CloudFront certificates have to be deployed in that region. You can't use, even though you might have a CloudFront distribution in a different region, the certificate for it has to be in uh, US East 1. So there are some caveats. Again, there is, uh, you can Google this online. There's the uh, policy, or I've got one. Um, see me later if you want a copy of it 
Uh, beware full access policies. So I mentioned earlier, some things you have full access policies. So for example, there's an EC2 full access policy, which will give people with uh, full access to EC2. And you're like, yeah, sweet. Everyone can create and terminate their own instances. They can you know, do volumes. They can do all that kind of stuff. Excellent. Um, Brilliant. They can also spin up really big instances that cost loads of money. Um, you might not want that. Uh, so some of the bigger instances, reasonable amount of cash per hour. Um, you probably want to avoid that. Again, you might even want to, in your own hobby account, make sure that oh, I don't really want to spin up anything other than like a T instance. So you can specify in the policy only allow like T3 instances or only allow like T3 micros or whatever. Um, so you can restrict the the instance size. Again, not just EC2, you've got Elasticash, you've got RDS, and a few other things that do uh, instance sizes. So you can restrict the size of the things that people were allowed to deploy. And again, if it's in a service control policy, that's across any account in your organization. So you could just ban people from starting X1 size instances anywhere, um, which is probably a good idea. Um, the other one is reserved instances. So EC2 full access will enable someone to go into your account like, you know, one of your really nice devs um, and go, oh, yeah, I'm just going to reserve an X1 size instance for three years, paying it all up front. And at the end of the month, you will get a very, very, very large bill. Um, now, if you ask AWS nicely, they, they might be inclined to help you out with, you know, not paying that. Um, but why put that in there? Um, so you can just basically restrict, again, via a service control policy, for example, that uh, no one... Uh, you probably don't want to do that via a service control policy because someone's going to want to be able to reserve instances somewhere uh, at some point. But for example, like your your developers group, even though they might have full access to EC2, you probably want to deny them the ability to spin up or to reserve instances, for example. Um, so just bear in mind that some full access policies grant things that you may not intend because um, there's an awful lot of actions that you can do um, for pretty much any resource. Uh, also, creating provision capacity. So things like uh, IO operations, uh, IOPS in uh, EBS, um, so disk performance stuff. Um, and again, DynamoDB, you can reserve capacity. That can be quite expensive um, if you're you know, reserving quite a lot. Uh, so again, like you probably want to restrict who can actually do that. So who can commit me slash the company to actually spending money? Um, you probably want to restrict who can, who can and can't do that. Uh, organizations, uh, we're coming to the end, don't worry. Uh, so uh, an organization is an account management service which basically consolidates multiple AWS accounts into an organization that you can manage centrally. Uh, you probably won't have one if you're uh, just a hobby person. Um, you absolutely should have one if you're a business of any size, um, purely because it gives you options later on for growing. So just create an organization from day one. Uh, Opinion, mine, obviously, uh, but I think the structure should be a journey based on your current situation and medium term plans. And I'm a developer, so Yagni, you ain't going to need it. Um, there are, if you Google like uh, AWS organization structure, they've got textbook ones that they will deploy for you um, or recommend that you do that have like five different accounts, multiple organizational units, dedicated accounts for logs, all kind of stuff, um, which is great. If you're a business of a certain size and that becomes relevant for you, again, if you're like a small company and you're just starting out and you've got like one, maybe even two people or maybe none uh, dedicated to this kind of stuff, um, why? Um, like, why would you do put yourself through that? Uh, so generally speaking, and yes, this, uh, this is very generally speaking because, you know, you can automate a lot of this stuff, which will briefly cover, uh, but adding extra accounts adds complexity. So it's just a case of where things live, what things talk to what, um, et cetera. It's kind of more mental overhead um, in certain ways. So what's worse than coming up with IAM policies? Trying to do that across accounts. Um, like it's just, it's just a pain um, sometimes, you know, once, you, once you've been doing it for a while, you're kind of like, oh, okay, it's it kind of become second nature. But if you're new to it, and this is the kind of thing you, if you started using AWS and you started with having to try work out across account stuff, you might be tempted to just give up um, because it just, it can be a bit of a, a bit of a minefield. Um, and it's just hard. Uh, yes, mate. So you've got your root account. That's 
one user, you've got your you account, that's two users, you've got your mate account, that's three. They become an organization that's the small or no, that's so, within an I am no, world. So your the root user, your personal user, and any other user you might create are identities. Within so, an organization. Within an account. Right. And then you can wrap that account in an organization. The and next you can have, tier up. Yeah. And you can have you can have identi in. multiple identities in like and you have identities over here, identities over here, identities everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you wanted. because uh, roles are also identities uh, for the yeah. purposes of I am. Um so yeah, it's kind of like they're the 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 things and the roles that uh, things might have or people might have in an account which is like well an account and then you wrap multiple accounts in an organization there's a diagram in a second pictures good <laughs> <laughs> no um so if you're starting off uh, you're probably going to go my organization phase one so if you're a business this is probably what you'd start with so you go i'm going to create an organization uh, you have an management account, which is the uh, sorry the account from which you say create an organization. Uh, that generally would house, in this scenario, it would house your users, so your IAM people, your groups, uh, your CloudTrail uh, logs, all of the stuff that we were talking about earlier. That all kind of fits in that. Um, and then you don't put anything in there. So you don't run servers in there. You don't run databases. You don't run, like nothing runs in that account. It's literally there as like, the the overseer and all the all your logs um or certainly your audit logs um and that kind of thing will go into that account all your users will log into that account um all your workloads so the things that you actually run all your applications all that kind of stuff they go in a second account and because we're talking about baselines you would apply the baseline to both um and your workloads account would send all of its cloud trail logs to the management account um, it's network logs to the management account so that you can effectively delete that account, but you've still got a record of what actually happened. So if someone does come in and delete the entire account, you know what happens because you recorded the log somewhere else in the management account. Um, generally speaking, you also want to consolidate your, your users so you wouldn't have separate users for each account. You put your users in one account and then they assume roles in another account. So Generally speaking, your roles in your other account might well match the groups that you have in the management account. So if you've got a developer's uh, group in the management account, they might assume the, a developer role in the workloads account, for example. Um, again, there's lots of ways of organizing that. This is kind of like my first org, as it were. Um, so phase two. That might be like, okay, well, I've got multiple workloads, but of course I've got like production, I've got staging, I've got dev, I've got a QA, I've got an integration thing or whatever. Um, they might be environments. You might have multiple environments in an account. Again, loads of different ways of, what's the word I'm looking for? Skinning the cat, yeah. Uh, no animals were harmed during this talk. Um, so yeah, you might just go, okay, I want to separate out, separate it out and maybe it's just literally an account per environment. And again, uh, you might also recognize the names from the networks from earlier. So each account gets its own network. Um, again, there's nothing stopping you from having multiple networks in an account if that's what you need. But the idea is, like with anything, you plan it a little bit and go, what do we need? What are we likely to need? How should we structure stuff? Um, because at some point, I say if you're lucky, I'm not sure I would call anyone running this lucky. Um, you could then go with the end game. So that is a diagram from one of those textbook things I was talking about uh, earlier, which is uh, a representative organization unit structure from an FSI banking customer. So if you're a bank and you really, really care about like isolation, security, auditing and stuff, uh, and you've got loads of different departments and they're all running different workloads and kind of all this kind of stuff, and you've got loads of people and also loads of people to admin stuff, you can split everything out uh, into really isolated accounts, uh, organizational units or groups of accounts. You can assign policies to each of those things individually. Um, uh, and yeah, but obviously I think, well, most people would agree. If I Certainly if I started with AWS and I saw that and go, yeah, we should deploy this just to run an EC2 instance, you'd be like, uh, what? Um, so yeah, it's something that, you know, it's a journey. You might start at the, where, uh, the phase one that we were talking about and then go to this. You might skip a few steps. Um, you might never get to that point. Um, 
lucky you um you might go for something in between um it will totally depend on effectively what your what your company is what it does what it's going to be doing how it's structured all that kind of stuff um yeah so i did say at the beginning i'm not going to go through the how um but the how part is actually really easy automate stuff uh, at no point generally ever mate you could do it with one account doing it in two accounts is just a bit annoying doing it in multiple accounts just clicking in the console just don't um, so automate as much of this as possible so you should have some form of deploying an account and baseline applying a baseline to it without actually having to do loads of click ops in the console uh, terraform for the win uh, i love terraform uh, i think it's awesome uh, cdk cloud formation if you must sorry to any uh cloud formation fans in the room <laughs> Uh, I'm biased, obviously. It's not that bad, maybe. It's, uh, it's not as good as Terraform. Uh, uh, also, there is a service. AW, there's a service for that, just like there's an app for that in, a, in AWS land. AWS Control Tower and uh, Landing Zones, which it deploys, uh, can automate all of the stuff that I've just gone through in terms of deploying an organization structure, an account baseline based on best practice, um, I don't know why I'm inviting commas. It is actually pretty good best practice, and it's, it's a pretty good solid solution. Um, the only downside is that it is very opinionated, and it covers more of the more towards the final uh, diagram in organizations rather than the first one. Um, so it's more geared towards kind of if you if you're coming from like on-prem maybe, and you want a particular structure, it will get you to the later steps quite quickly. Um, as I said, it's very opinionated, uh, and it kind of trades flexibility for speed of deployment. So you can deploy stuff with it very quickly, but there's a certain amount of flexibility that you lose. Don't look at me like that. There is. I, no, I'm not covering that. <laughs> there are there are there are caveats to it. So again, control tower is something you're only going to need, which is I mentioned it at the very end. If you're a business of a certain size and you want to do certain things, um, if you're like again a small business, if you're a hobby person, you don't want to be playing with this because even though you're deploying stuff quickly you still actually need to know what it's deploying how it works because as we go back to the beginning and talk about like the uh, shared responsibility model just because you click it and run it doesn't mean that you're like done i can tick all of my security auditing and risk boxes just by doing this thing you still need to understand what you've deployed, how it works, what gaps are, how you might want to customize it to your, your use case. Um, yeah, you still need to know what it's doing. Um, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>